Good evening. And thank you so much, everyone, for being here. And first of all, happy birthday to us. It's our 50th, today is our 50th birthday, which is huge. Um, I actually had the pleasure of meeting our first chairman of the board a couple years ago, Patsy Hedricks, Chamberlain Hedricks, and um, she told me her story. She told me like how it all started, and it was it was it was wonderful. I mean, we we have we have some wonderful people that have been part of this organization. So it's it's, it's thank you all for for being part of this. Thank you, Kirsten. Um, it's good to see you all here tonight. Um, and um, it's a very special night for us. It was 50 years ago today that our Articles of Incorporation were issued. And we live by those articles. We have them in a file. We digitize them. And I know the names that are on the, on the document. And it's amazing it was 50 years ago. But because of this important milestone, I'm going to jump back and tell you briefly about this society. And I'm going to tell you briefly about what Boca was like when the society was formed. In 1972, Little Boca Raton was rapidly changing and expanding, and historic landmarks were being lost right and left. And in addition, our original pioneers were being lost right and left, and we were losing their stories. Um, imagine this. During the 60s, prior to 1972, both FAU and Boca High opened. We had a new hospital. IBM had arrived. Our VITA was beginning to build its gated communi communities, transforming the community. And from 1960 to 1970, the population tripled to more than 28,000. Against this backdrop, a group of citizens got together to start a historical society to preserve Boca Raton's history. The new Junior Service League, later the Junior League, um, was part of this, and they decided to take the matter in hand and make this their very first community project. And so it was that Patsy Chamberlain, representing the Junior League, or the Junior Service League, served as the first president, and pioneer, Boca pioneer Dave Ash served as the chairman of the board. Together they worked with longtime residents to begin collecting artifacts and documenting the rapid growth of the little farm town that has become the modern cosmopol cosmopolitan city that we know today. And many of our artifacts actually in our pioneer exhibit are from these very early days. So this, this is where we started. Mm -hmm. By 1973, the Historical Society had already emerged as the town's advocate for historic preservation as a campaign to preserve the Howe Mansion, which stood next to the Inlet Bridge. This is where the Waterstone Hotel is today. It was the first of many historic preservation projects that we lost. <laughs> <laughs> However, we moved on and we have some that we did win. And um, these are some that you all know. We saved this 1914 Singing Pines house, which is, that became the Children's Museum. The 1930 Cabana Club Port Cochere. We um, restored Town Hall, built in 1927. We purchased and restored the FEC Railway Depot. And then later we restored the Streamline Rail Cars that are located near the depot. We are also instrumental in establishing the city's two historic districts. Old Floresta and Pearl City. And historic preservation advocacy continues to be at the heart of our mission. The Society is the author of most of the scholarship on the topic of Boca Raton's history, including many books authored by our curator and others, our ever-expanding website, and by the way, we launched a new website this week, so take a look. And our website is loaded with historic content, such as the Spanish River Papers, and the searchable Boca Raton News. We recently signed the paperwork for our newspapers to be available on newspapers.com, which is a huge achievement. Our historic collections acquired over the past 50 years are used by researchers from all over the country, from fourth graders to journalists to professional historians. These collections represent the primary resource on Boca Raton's history. Our education programs for local school children are well known, and our programs are approved by the school district of Palm Beach County. Our tours, which began in 1974, our lecture series, and our expanding traveling exhibits program remain popular. 
Thinking back 10 years ago when we celebrated our 14th anniversary, and Jim Ballarama, you'll remember this, um, we started talking about where we wanted to be when we turned 50. So after an ongoing strategic planning process and many twists and turns, we decided to create a family-friendly interactive history museum in Town Hall. It was also time to upgrade the building for 21st century exhibits and artifacts. And this combined project was titled History Alive. We began worth working with an exhibit design firm, Creative Arts Unlimited, and we appealed to the city who owns Town Hall, and they, which, and they generously agreed to partner with us on the renovations to the building. We raised funds from the community, we reached our campaign goal, and we covered our costs. Today, the Historical Society emerges, emerges into its second half century with a beautiful, new, professionally designed museum, the Schmidt Boca Raton History Museum. And we have many people to thank for this. Many people in this room contributed to this project. Our founders, our pioneers, our members, our leaders, and our donors. I would like to ask all of our past presidents, presidents who are here tonight to please stand. Thank you. Okay. All right. All right. Now, past board members and past Myrtle Bucks Fleming awardees. Okay, it's going to be half the room. Come on. There you go. Okay. Thank you all for your contributions. You have made the growth of the Historical Society and its amazing historical historical collections possible. And you ask, why is this important? We believe that history is a learning tool for the present and the future, and that sharing local history is key to building a sense of community and a sense of place in our Boca Raton. And now I'd like to show you a short video that will sh take you through our History Alive project from beginning to end.
all right, quick, quick comments that I wanted to make. Number one, it's been an interesting two years. And I don't think anybody in this room will ever know what, except maybe Frank, what Mary's had to endure between COVID, between the museum, between all of it. I don't think anyone's ever going to know. So thank you, Mary. You are a rock star. The second thing, if you've not spent more than five minutes with Sue Gillis, our, our uh, world-class curator, um, you need to, really. It, it's a pleasure. So do that. Book that. Um, the board, it's been a pleasure. I, it's an honor. I, you know, it was an interesting time, but I, I'm so honored to have been here for the last two years. So thank you very much for that, for your trust and, and all that. And thank you that we've got this wonderful board. We really do, and it's getting better and better. And um, yeah, like I said, what did I say? Energy and warmth, I believe, is um, our personality as a board. All right, we've got some awards. It's hard to do the awards because everybody, everybody jumps in. Everybody does so much. So it, it's, you know, I don't know, single people up. Um, Sal D'Amico, are you here? Tonight? No, Sal? Okay. This guy is the guy that we're sitting at a board meeting and Mary says we have this big thing sitting outside and like, how do we actually get it onto the wall? He takes care of it in 24 hours. I mean, unbelievable. He just shows up and he does it and it's like, and he brought us our biggest um, um, donors. So we are very grateful to him. Lori Saunders, I mean, she has been doing vintner dinners for years. Like, it, it's like a full-time job and a half. So she digs her heels in and she, does an amazing job. We're so grateful to have her. Everybody does. Everybody jumps in and does a lot. Um, I think she just went a little bit above and beyond, honestly. Um, Zoe, can you, where, where are you? Zoe is at um, the Addison and she has jumped in and done so much for us. Like we have very good friends in the community and we're very grateful for our friends. Um, I wanted to have an award for you, Zoe, um, to thank you for everything that you've done for us. And um, Olivia, I, I don't know anybody that's done more in the last year than you have. So where are you? Um, thank you. I, I have an award for you as well. So I wanted to, you know, give a shout out to um, those people that really, really are, are doing a lot. Um, we all are, actually. I think the whole board has really done a lot. Um, let me see here. Sue, you have more awards? Seriously, if you have not spent more than five minutes with Sue, she's a world-class curator, and we are so fortunate to have her. I hate her saying <laughs> Well, this is my great pleasure. So I don't usually get to give out the award, so I'm really excited tonight. So first of all, I want to tell you all, can you all hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay, very good. Uh, we have a new presentation uh, called the Dave Ash Award. Uh, and I want to tell you a little bit about my friend, Mr. Dave Ash, uh, a founding member of our society. It's my pleasure to announce a brand new Historical Society Award recognizing individuals who have contributed not necessarily money, but artifacts and information to our very important historical museum collections. We have named this award in honor of one of our founding members, Mr. Dave Ash. Dave grew up in a houseboat on the Hillsborough Canal because his dad was the bridge tender at the Federal Highway Bridge, if you can imagine that, between Deerfield and Boca Raton. Um, and he is actually the first donor listed in our accession ledger. Whoop. It says, Dave Ash, notebooks of photographs, news clippings, and photos. 
so sure enough. <laughs> um, and uh, one of my favorite donations he's made over the years is actually in the exhibit case in the back. It's a bright yellow shirt from the Lions Club, which that was a very big, important organization here, one of the first civic organizations in town. Um, and Dave was always my, one of my go-to guys. If I had a historical question, I know I could go to him. Uh, I miss him very, very much. Uh, and we're very pleased tonight to have his son, Joe, and Joe's partner, Georgine, here, also very longtime residents. And I want to thank you for your dad. Uh, and I want to present you with a very small gift. Thank you so much for being here. Now, uh, as the first Dave Ash Award winner, we want to recognize another dear friend, Linda Proud Jackson. I met Linda back in 2002 when I first came on board here. She resided in Boca Raton since 1957, is that correct? Uh, and was a very proud graduate of Boca High's first graduating class, the class of 66. Linda often told me, we built this city on rock and roll, uh, referring to her generation and how they helped mold a small farming town with a fancy hotel uh, into one of our country's most desirable addresses. And it's really true. Linda was my ambassador to the community. Um, she would often see an old photo or someone's letter sweater on the old Boca 2 Facebook page or Boca High Facebook page, Pioneer Club, uh, and she would write, why don't you donate that to the Historical Society? Uh, your kids don't want it, they're gonna throw it away. <laughs> now she was correct, but that's, that's nothing, not something I felt I could personally say, you know what I mean? Uh, and in this way, she gleaned many wonderful additions to our collections, particularly from the 60s and 70s. Some of them are on display, quite a few are on display, actually. Uh, the crown of the last queen of the Fiesta de Bocarton is in the hallway. In the back, at the, on the platform, we have a um, cheerleading dress uh, and a letter sweater. Uh, in the case, we have a Miss Teen Town, I think it's Lynn Crotwell's tiara and sash. And the greatest treasure, really, that I think Linda would agree with me, is a signed ball from the Boca High 1965 uh, varsity baseball team. Remember, they're juniors, okay? They won the state championship. And this was like, Wow, this little tiny brand new school. That was just thrilling, wasn't it? Uh, and wonderful. And the, so the survivors of the team and Linda said, you know, we really want the Historical Society to have this because we know we will we'll take care of it and it will be here in perpetuity. Uh, so we lost Linda last year far too young of an age. I miss her sense of humor her great enthusiasm and belief in the importance of history as a guide for the present and future. She really believed that. Uh, Linda's name will be the first of many on uh, this a plaque, I will show you in a moment, which will remain here in Town Hall. Here it is. So Linda's the first name on the Dave Ash Award. But in addition, uh, we are pleased to have many family uh, members and friends here tonight, uh, and I believe her grandson Connor is here to accept this award uh, on her behalf. Connor? Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. I'm so honored to receive this award on my grandmother, Linda Jackson's behalf. She would be so thrilled knowing her work and dedication would not be forgotten. Linda was so passionate. Linda was so passionate with Boca Raton. 
Our family was born and raised here in Boca Raton for the past 60 plus years. Linda was the first graduating class of Boca Raton, as she said. She became a librarian for a Boca Community Library for a large uh, portion of her life. Following that, she then tried to save Boca Elementary Gymnasium. It was recognized for what she did for the community. I would like to wrap this up by saying, my grandmother was a spirited, passionate, giving woman that loved her city and everyone in it. I'm so honored, and I know she is smiling from the heavens, knowing that her first grand grandson had the opportunity to speak on her behalf. Thank you so much, and God bless. Our most prestigious award, uh, the Myrtle Butts Fleming Award for this year, 2022. I want to tell you a little bit about it first. The Society of Museum awards an annual Myrtle Butts Fleming Award to an individual who has shown their commitment to our organization and mission through their long-term contribution of their time and their energies. Myrtle was a founding member of the Historical Society and a great role model for those who have followed in her footsteps. Since 1998, Barbara Montgomery O'Connell has served as our very own artist in residence, creating not only the artwork for our beautiful commemorative glass and ceramic ornaments, but also images for sale in the museum store for invitations and other special occasions. She has also generously donated the original precious watercolors to our collections. Some of our favorites include Town Hall, Old Fluorescent, that sold out by the way, IBM, that sold out, the Administration Building, it's about to be sold out, Miser Park, sold out, and the Cabana Club, and we still have plenty of those. By the way, many of her designs, as I said, are sold out. When we need a beautiful illustration, we just say, let's call Barbara. Uh, and she always responds. In recognition of this unfailing service, we award the 2022 Myrtle Butts Fleming Award to Barbara Montgomery O'Connor. unbelievable chair, invigorating and encouraging the board to take an active role alongside Mary and her team to further develop and promote the Boca Raton Historical Society's mission and beyond. You're always kind and soft-spoken, yet you empower us all. You stepped into the role of chairman at the onset of the pandemic, but you navigated us through uncharted waters with poise, optimism, and resilience. Thank you for your unwavering passion and dedication to the Bokertone Historical Society and the Schmidt Bokertone History Museum. You've been a fantastic board chair 
a mentor to me. You are my speed dial. And we are thrilled that you're staying on the board of trustees. Thank you for everything you've done. Okay, well, I am humbled and honored to step into the role of chairman of the Board of Trustees. When I first joined the board three years ago, I certainly did not foresee today. What I can say is that it's been an amazing and enriching experience to sit on the board alongside wonderful fellow board members who have become friends. I admire each and every one of you from the bottom of my heart I thank you for entrusting me to take on this position of leadership. I look forward to working with you and Mary. We're going to be best friends, I think. <laughs> and you'll be on my speed dial as well. Um, the Bokerton Historical Society and the Schmidt Bokerton History Museum is a precious, one-of-a-kind gem in the heart of Boca Raton. We are the People's Museum, the keepers of our city's history, keeping it alive. We provide our community with a sense of place, and that's incredibly important to me as a mom raising two young boys right here in Boca. I take this opportunity to serve on the board seriously and promise to do my very best. We celebrate the Boca Raton Historical Society's 50th birthday today. Together, let's set the momentum for another wonderful 50 years to come in Boca Raton, our special city we call home. So, and then now, all right. <laughs> Thank you. And tonight we have a very, very special guest um, as we celebrate our 50th anniversary. The Articles of Incorporation were actually signed on this day 50 years ago. The party responsible for the articles, who is listed as secretary, was a long, young lawyer named Frank Sayer, recruited by Dave Ash himself. Tonight, we are very pleased to welcome one of our true founding members, Mr. Frank Sayer, who will tell us a bit about the society's founding. Doing yes, that's right. Talk about following a hard act, I'll tell you that. Everybody, uh, I'm from Gainesville, Florida, but and I've been to a lot of not-for-profit meetings over 77 years. Um, <clears throat> this has been one of the most impressive ones I've ever attended. And I think you should be very proud of your leadership and your board and uh, you, what you've accomplished. But I was asked to come and speak on memories from 1972. Wow. <laughs> I, I have the distinct feeling that the only reason I sh should be here is because I've survived that long. I, <laughs> I wish I could tell you the answer of all that. I think it's luck. Um, so l let me take you back and I... I've been told by various people to make this three or four minutes. <laughs> Others said, just say ditto and sit down. Uh, but I would like to give you a little bit of my thoughts about what things were like and how I remember them. And then if you have any questions, I have no problem trying to answer your questions. Uh, it could be unusual maybe for the meetings you've got here, but I'd like to open that up for questioning if it's possible. So 1972, I was first year out of law school. And, you know, the 70s were shortly after a great deal of um, our own pandemic, which was the Vietnam War. Some of you are old enough to remember that. And, you know, those friends of mine I remember at the time, if um, you hadn't been to Vietnam, you were in the reserves or you were looking over your shoulder all the time. It was a scary time. I graduated uh, and uh, took a job right away with a firm called Tyler and Declare Becker and Van Cleek. I don't know if any of you knew any of those people, but uh, Robert Tylander, George Declare, David Van Cleek, 
um, Tom Becker. I think they're all deceased, unfortunately. But we were at the on the top floor of the uh, at that time. What was it called, Penny? First Bank and Trust Company. Yeah. Now it's called Bank of America. I visited there today. The building is still in very good shape. Uh, better shape than than I thought it would be. It's very nice. But my background at that time was I'd gone through law school. wasn't sure what type of lawyer I wanted to be. Decided I wanted to do a lot of real estate, but I also was interested in litigation and things like that. But um, I think it was George declared that said, I want you to go meet David Ash. And it's appropriate, I think, tonight that you've got a new award in David's name because um, as far as influencing me, he was the biggest influence in my getting involved with the Historical Society, uh, Boca Raton Historical Society. The Junior League was, was behind it. I think that his wife at the time, Betty, was a member of that league, and I think she might have expressed her feelings to Dave and said, you know, well, let's go make this happen. But Dave had his own interests in history. He could tell you about, gosh, the pirates of the past and the things that happened on the beach and, you know, just strange stories of people that had lived here a long time, not only in Boca, but he could talk to you about Pompano, he could talk to you about Del Rey, West Palm Beach. Uh, he just, he loved history. So I think the Junior League said, we'd like to start a historical society. We're losing uh, artifacts and, and buildings. And at that time, uh, let me describe Boca to you. <clears throat> You've seen the pictures of 1983. Boca was not near as green as it is now. Back then, there was lots of vacant lots that were just left laying. So there were, you know, dirt and sand and weeds and stuff like that. Uh, the, the trees that you all have now, the, the, the greenery that's in this uh, community is very impressive. Even on your main streets, it's green. You're very lucky, and uh, that's not a accident that that happened. Your city fathers that were on the commissions back in the 60s and 70s um, were not very popular, and in fact I would say they were unpopular with developers, real estate developers, contractors, builders, planners. Everyone said, stay away from Boca. It's too expensive to build anything there. My gosh, they make you do all of these terrible things. I'll go build in Pompano, or I'll go build in Fort Lauderdale, I'll go to Palm Beach County, it's better up there. Um, my law firm, you know, handled the lawsuit regarding the growth cap. I don't know if any of you are, still know what the growth cap was, but it was a, an ordinance passed by the city commission back then that was unprecedented because it said when you reach a certain number of units, they based it on dwellings, not people. When you reach this cap, no more permits are going to be issued. No one else can come into town. The only way you could come into town and build something is if you acquire it, tear it down, and bring it to us as vacant land, and then we'll consider it. My law firm, and especially a, a fellow named Tom Becker, uh, handled that litigation. It went on for, I'm thinking now, five, six years. <clears throat> and. Um, Eventually, the court system determined, I'm sorry, city commissioners, you cannot do that. But you can imagine the hostilities that would happen because <clears throat> our lawsuit had to be filed against your city government. Um, so um, the city commission then had to hire lawyers and spend lots of the, mem the citizens' monies to defend the lawsuit. And we ended up, my lawsuit, or the lawsuit, ended up uh, with the courts saying, Boca Raton, you cannot do that. It's, it violates the United States Constitution in several areas. Freedom of travel, freedom to live where you want to, and that sort of thing. So you can't just say no more units. In any event, back to, I'm, I'm meandering, excuse me, I don't have a, a set agenda here. 
but Boca Raton at the time was difficult to, to build anything. And, and when Arvida came, they had the political clout and the finances and a few other developers to start building things. So the easiest thing to do was to tear some stuff down. And they didn't particularly care about what it was, as I'm sure Mary has uh, showed you all. It's some very vital buildings that you just had to go. And there was no stockpiling of buildings. There was no place to put them, so you got to destroy them. Well, that, of course, raises the fact that history is an important thing to follow. And you don't want a city that looks completely brand new. You know, I, I'm sure a lot of you, like today, my wife and I, we looked for a place to eat that was older and privately owned. We don't want a chain. We don't want what we've had 60 times in the last year. We wanted something different. So variety, I think, is the spice, and you've got that in this city. So back to where we were at the time, George DeClaire and Bob Tylander called me in and said, Frank, you know, we're not very popular with the city of Boca Raton right now. We're, we're fighting them in court. So you keep your ears open. Find some good projects. Well, I was a young lawyer. I majored in history. It's one of my two degrees, but one of them was history. So my history was important to me. One day, I had a no plan, but I got a call. Dave Ash is in the conference room. He wants to talk to you. I go in. Dave says, Frank, this morning, I want to start, I want to create an entity to, to have a historical society. And I said, well, could you give me a few minutes? Now, there were no computers in 1972. <laughs> there was no instant research. There was no Googling. As I like to tell people, back then, if we needed to talk to somebody, you got them on the phone or you sent a letter and waited two weeks. Yeah. That was it. There was no alternatives. You know, you couldn't drive to talk to everybody all the time. And, they, and believe me, lawyers are great about dodging phone calls. When they don't want to talk to you, it's real simple to say, tell the secretary, I'm busy. Okay, so I said to Dave, all right, can you give me a few minutes? And I went next door and grabbed a law book that I happened to bring with me from the year before and looked under corporations. I had never created a not-for-profit corporation. I was familiar with for-profit corporations and that sort of thing, but anyway, I did the research and went back and I found a form. I said, uh, you, you want to do this this morning, Dave? And he said, yes, I want to have it done by lunch. I've got a couple guys up in the lunchroom and they'll sign the paper with us. You know, the, the, the Junior League is involved, but they're too busy and they're all over the place. I want to do this today so we can have a bank account and to have a bank account for a corporation, we want the corporation to exist. We've got to have it today. And I said, today? There's no internet. I can't do this by internet. I said, all right, well, let me get right on that. <clears throat> so as it turned out, the day that's on the charter is not the day that it got to Tallahassee because I had to put it in the mail. <laughs> so you all might think you existed today, and in your minds you did. <laughs> The state of Florida probably didn't know about it for a week and a half. <laughs> and sure enough, Dave took me, we, we got my secretary who put this form together in an, an hour, and he, my memory is he took me up to the, you remember the luncheon club that was on top of the bank building? Am I going too long? Is that what you're telling me? Bankers, Bankers club, yeah. <laughs> And, you know, there was a, the owner of a car dealership was up there, he had lots of money. Dave sits down with him and said, you know, I need some money, I need some money, we're going to save some buildings. And the guy said, well, look, if I give you a check, will you let us finish lunch? <laughs> and um, so we, anyway, we got the signatures that day, signed everything, had it notarized. That got me interested in <clears throat> historical society, so... I said, when they asked me, I said, sure, I'll serve as secretary, and at least I'll tell you about the Roberts Rules of Orders. <laughs> because as a lawyer, you learn that stuff. It sort of seeps into you, you know, you know what to do with Roberts Rules of Order. And that led to being the first chairman of the board after, um, let's see, no. Dave was first chairman. I guess I was elected the second one when he stepped around, stepped down or something like that. Is that the way it worked? I couldn't, can't remember. 
but that's when I started to find more people like Dave out there that really wanted to get things done and quickly. And Patsy Chamberlain, of course, was terrific. Uh, Miss Personality, I call her. Just uh, exactly what you all need. A nice looking lady <laughs> who's soft spoken and smiles at you when she says, of course you will have to give some money. <laughs> now, I, I've served on about 10 boards and I can certainly tell you that not-for-profits have one big thing in common. I'm sure Remy can tell you this too. Money is always the biggest issue. Creating uh, interest by the public so that you can receive the donations that you need for your interest. Um, so that's what it was like to start. Getting to know Dave, um, Dave Ash was a wonderful thing and we used to be, became friends in my opinion <clears throat> after I, gosh it seems like five, six years after I moved to Gainesville, he called me one weekend and said, I just miss talking to you, Frank. I just want to see how you are. And I, I said, well, you're the only client that's done that. Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, another a big thing, of course, I was thinking about back in 1972 when I filled up my car with gas today at almost $5 a gallon. Do you know what the average price per gallon of gas was in 1972? 36 cents a gallon. That's the average. So there was less. There were sales at 25 cents a gallon. But, I, but for $5, or usually 5 to $6, you could fill up a big tank. What a difference, you know? And, um, so the people that put the money up to start this organization, you know, sacrificed a lot more than some of us do today because the money was much smaller in my opinion, back in 1972. Um, and what you have turned it into with a museum like this, you should be very proud, very excited. Um, Boca Raton is lucky to have you. And with that, I'd like to open it up for any questions. Anybody have anything they'd like to ask me? And if not, I'll just say the meeting's gone long enough. And, <laughs> and thank you very much. Thank you so much for making the drive from Gainesville, and thank you for being one of our founding members. We are here because of you, Dave Ash, and all of the founding members, so thank you so much. Before we adjourn, I would like to give a very special thanks to board member Joyce DeVita. Oh, Joyce, there you are. Thank you for all of your hard work preparing for today's event. Coming freshly off of Boca Back and Now, we're not giving you a chance to rest. So thank you so much. You've outdone yourself with the catering, the preparing. Um, your attention to details is unparalleled. So thank you so much. And also a special thanks to board member Phyllis Robinson, who can't be here today, but she sponsored the delicious celebratory cupcakes this is such a sweet way to kickstart our Golden Jubilee year, so thank you, Phyllis. Wow, it has been a full and exciting past year. I think Mary would agree, <laughs> and everybody else. Um, we look forward to another great year ahead. We have a wonderful reception, so please enjoy, and thank you for coming.